Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here with Mr. Nikola Danilov. He's a number, he's a number one best-selling author of Conversations with the Future, a keynote speaker, futurist, strategic advisor, popular blogger, and podcast host, also known as Socrates in the Singularity community. He has spoken at public events on topics ranging from technology, transhumanism, and the technological singularity to new media, blogging, and podcasting. He has been profiled in Next Stage Rising Stars magazine and has been interviewed himself for numerous documentary films, blogs, podcasts, magazines and newspapers. So, Mr. Danilo, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. My pleasure. Okay, so I would like to ask you first, because I guess that most people won't know what we're talking about here. What is the singularity? Well, the singularity, we are borrowing a term from mathematics and from physics. So in math, basically a singularity is a problem with undefined answer. So for example, a five divided by zero, it's undefined, so it's a singularity. In physics, a singularity is a black hole. It's a place where the laws of the universe uh, don't hold as we know them, or there's a so-called rupture in the space-time fabric, or is a black hole because no light escapes, or that's what we used to think anyway, that no light escapes. So now we're borrowing this term from physics into technology with respect to our current models and our ability to model and predict the future. And we're saying that based on no enormously disruptive effects of exponential technology, we are reaching the point where the merger of a number of the different technologies converging together, things like artificial intelligence, genetics, robotics, nanotech, synthetic biology, 3D printing, cryptocurrencies, etc., are all coming together to a point or bringing us towards a point where our ability to predict and model the future and what would happen barely 10 or 20 years from now is literally falling apart because the changes are coming and they're so deep and so profound and have such, if you will, unforeseen consequences that permeate throughout all dimensions of our civilization that we are literally unable to model and, and predict the future anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, and could you also explain to us the notion of exponential growth? What is that about exactly? So, <clears throat> exponential growth is, uh, is basically the idea that, uh, let's say you have two types of growth, linear or exponential. So, linear basically is when you walk and you take a step, one, two, three, four, five, 30 steps later, you're 30 steps, steps away from the beginning, from where you started. Now, imagine you have uh, exponential growth, for example, uh, for about maybe 35 years in um, uh, uh, microprocessors, we had the so-called Moore's Law. Uh, and Moore's Law moved along exponential growth where every roughly 18 months or so, give or take, the price performance of a computer would double for the same $1,000. So doubling means that the first step we have uh, two from one, the second step though we get four, then we get 8, then we get 16, then we get 32, then we get 64, then we have 128, 256, 512, 1024. And so in 20 steps, we are a million steps away from where we started. In 30 steps, we are a billion steps away from where we started. And to put it in perspective, because our brains have issues with numbers like million, let alone billion or more, uh, a billion steps is about 25 times around the Earth. So compare that to linear growth or, uh, where we have 30 steps and we end up 30 steps from where we started and exponential growth where in 30 steps by doubling every step of the way we are 25 times around the Earth. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to get a, bit, a little bit more down to Earth here, when will we know that we have reached the singularity? In what ways will it manifest, let's say, at the societal, technological and scientific levels? 
Well, <laughs> that's a very tricky question because um, it's all about measurement. And as we know, different people, different civilizations, different businesses, different governments, different organizations uh, use different yardstick. And so um, for some, it could be the case that we have reached the singularity when machines equal uh, the intelligence of human in in most or, or in all things pretty much. In others, uh, maybe we need to reach the level where a single machine is as smart as the whole human race. Uh, according to others, uh, the singularity may be even the, po the moment where machines would basically replace humanity. Mm -hmm. And according to others, uh, maybe we would have reached a singularity at a point where we simply turn a new page. We simply are able to overcome today's barriers, which at that moment would be already yesterday's barriers, that were basically withholding the human race. Uh, and those could be th uh, our limits with respect to, let's say, mortality, life extension. Uh, so we might be able to reach what Dr. Aubrey de Grey calls longevity escape velocity, which is indefinite life extension. We might be able to reach uh, things like we can make biology completely flexible, which is to say we would be able to choose our rec uh, race, age, sex, uh, and physical attributes. Uh, and we can change them and shift them uh, while we're living. So we don't need to do that in vitro. We do it in vivo for living organisms, for ourselves, and we can just manipulate those the way we manipulate cold today. For others, it may be the, the moment where we actually become a stage three civilization and we're able to um, absorb all the energy of our star. Or for others, it would be that we must go beyond our solar system, right? Uh, and, and start populating the cosmos or the universe, if you will, right? So that's another singularity. So it all de depends on what's your point of reference. What do you care about? And and how do you want to it, define it, right? So I, I think as far as our planet is concerned, with respect to our planet, uh, I, I, oh, and by the way, climate change could be, in a way, also another singularity of its own kind, by the way, right? Because basically a singularity is a rupture with the past. So we have a certain trajectory of climate on our planet for thousands of years. Then suddenly, this kind of biopedal ape-descendant life, life form starts burning fossil fuels to the extreme point where the whole planet starts warming up to a point where it gets into a disequilibrium and it gets totally out of whack. And then the currents, the, uh, the ocean currents, uh, the, the species that have existed for millions of years, everything starts either disappearing or radically changing and transforming. And so in a way, even if you will, climate change would be uh, a singularity uh, once it reaches its crescendo or its climax. And so it all depends what's your point of reference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so would you say that we can say that it will always imply that we reach a point in terms of technological and scientific development where we are able to transcend, let's say, our biological limitations and we know that with the tools that we have at our disposal, whatever problem arrives, we are able, we are certain that we can solve it. Well, I, I don't know if we would ever reach a point where we would be able to immediately solve all of our problems. Mm -hmm. It is just that we would be able to solve the previous problems. Now, the thing about life is that, you know, the older you get, the bigger the problems that you start facing, right? So today we can face and, and solve yesterday's problems, but today's problems are bigger and harder than yesterday's problems, right? So maybe we'll solve uh, cancer, maybe we'll, we'll solve poverty, 
uh, and will solve uh, renewable uh, solar energy at uh, near zero marginal cost, like uh, Jeremy Rifkin uh, imagines or argues, right? But then we would have a whole other set of problems. You know, maybe we we would solve those, but we wouldn't be able to solve indefinite life extension, or we would solve indefinite life extension, but we wouldn't be able to solve how we go beyond Mars or beyond our solar system. So there's always going to be a new challenge on the horizon. I don't think there's ever going to be a point where we would know or be able to solve everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, this implies a lot of futurism and trying to predict perhaps uh, how science and technology will develop and what sorts of technological develop developments we will have in the future and things like that. So would you say that there's perhaps at least a margin of error that we can work with to say that perhaps some of the things that people project will happen might not happen? Oh, I would say, in fact, uh, the closer to the singularity we become, by its very nature, our margin of error would be greater and greater all the time. That's the very nature that we don't know. And, and because there's so many things happening all at once, and they're so deep and so profound, and they would have such amazing, unforeseen consequences that the, the margin of error... So let's say if you lived uh, 800 years ago, like let's say in the 1200, right? It was not very hard to predict that 50 or 100 years from from that point onwards, you would still have a king, you would still have the feudal system, you would still have the clergy, and you you may not be able to predict who's going to fight whom in, in what war and when and why, but you would be able to predict that there will be certain kinds of wars, maybe even religious wars and stuff, which we had the crusades and all that stuff. And you can kind of extrapolate that. And, and the peasants would still be peasants. The kings would still be kings. There was not much change that happened over 100 years back then. And, you know, the, the peasant who was born in a village would die in that same village. And his great-grandchildren would be born and live and die there too, doing the same thing that their great-great-grandfather did, more or less, right? Today, that's no longer the case. Today it's hard to predict what we would be doing just in a couple of years from now and let alone our children let alone our great children let alone our great grandchildren like the world would be so different i'm 43 years old and you know i was born before the iron curtain fell apart uh, in communist eastern europe and by the time i was 13 and a half that uh, wall fall, fall, fell down uh, and then the world's been constantly changing, and now it's almost unrecognizable several times over, by the way, since uh, since I've been alive. And and um, even if you will, there will be smaller singularity in things like, for example, economics, right? So cryptocurrencies are a singularity with respect to the financial system, and maybe even a lot more things than that, right? Bitcoin is a singularity of money, if you will simply put, then um, technological unemployment, for example, could be another profoundly shaking economic singularity, right? If machines are able to replace us at every job that we ever uh, hope to do, and it doesn't have to be 100% of us, you know, the Great Depression happened with only about 25 to 30% um, unemployment. So if we reach something like 45 or 50%, it would be twice worse than the Great Depression, right? That would be a profound singularity with economic and political repercussions. You know, think about the crime waves and the political upheaval that happened around that time, and now multiply that by two. And, you know, I don't think that 50% of the jobs would be replaced. I think it will be, in the next two or three decades, will be more than 50%, actually. And so it would be even deeper and more profound effect and it could actually happen a lot faster too by the way and that would have tremendous political implications so that could create a total singularity just in the political realm where if we get to play our cards wrong we can have violent uprisings i mean look at paris that's just a small tiny little taste right so much so that we can get to destroy the system, the political system, everything that our civilization has built, 
and go back in time by hundreds of years. And now think about all those things that I'm mentioning, like cryptocurrencies, technological unemployment, artificial intelligence, genetics, they're all sufficiently profound on their own right. But the thing is, they're all coming at us simultaneously at the same time, and they're all kind of uh, going to reach the climax point within the next decade or so, give or take, two decades maybe in some cases. And so this is going to be a profound period for the future of the human species, and quite honestly, the reason why it's a singularity is because we don't know if we're going to make it or not, and how or how many of us and in what shape or form. Mm -hmm. and, and what are some of the main types of technology that we can expect with greater accuracy that we will have in the future that will develop perhaps in the short term uh, and that would be important stepping stones in our progress for us to be able to increase perhaps the rate of growth and keep up with all with all of the social and humanistic progress that we've been experiencing. Well, I, I, the, you see, the technology is very important, but I don't think that the whether we would succeed or fail would depend on the technology. Actually, mm -hmm. I think it would depend on other factors, and that's mostly us, our ethics, and our ability to be able to work together. I mean, think about it. We know climate change is happening for a fact. There is absolutely no doubt about that, right? There's like 90 some percent, I don't know, 98% of the scientists agree about it, right? There's always someone who would say something different, of course, but the vast majority, we, we can prove it in so many different ways, right? And yet, and, and we know we are the cause. We know it's a, a anthropocentric, we know we are the cause of it. We know that things like uh, burning fossil fuel, consuming uh, meat at ridiculous amounts and, and increasing our consumption of meat, just like increasing our consumption of fossil fuels and construction are the worst kind of uh, reasons, right? We don't need technological, new technology to make change in, that, in those realms. And yet we're failing to do that. All we need to do is do, change our habits. But it turns out, and come to agreement, right, to do it together. But it turns out that's nearly impossible, right? So we don't need new technology to agree on climate change is a fact. We can't even do that, let alone come up with a with a proper uh, sort of agreement on it. And so you can say, well, we have the Paris Agreement. Sure, yes, we do. Let's talk about two examples which are big champions of the Paris Agreement, France and Canada, right? Canada is hopelessly behind uh, all of our commitments for the Paris Agreement is hopelessly behind, right? And our great Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, big supporter of the Paris Agreement, we are hopelessly behind. We can never achieve what we are committed to achieve, given what we've done in the past right now. Uh, same with France. Uh, you know, uh, President Macron tried to uh, sort of start implementing parts of the agreement with uh, the carbon tax and look what happened. Right, people are basically having another revolution, almost, almost. Right, so it's not the technology; it's like basically us having the courage to change our behavior, and that means driving less or in a drift different way, and eating less or in a different way. Right, so uh, in North America, in Europe, that's not such a big problem. In North America, we generally overeat and we're ridiculously fast. We suffer from ridiculous levels of obesity and ridiculous levels of diabetes and related diseases, cardiovascular diseases, the biggest killer. And so, but, but the reason is that we overconsume, of course. And so today, the danger of us here in North America is not not having enough food to eat, but actually the danger is overeating and overconsuming, right? And then the worst part of that is the meat consumption, which is, we know, terrible for the animals, terrible for the planet and the environment, and terrible for our own health. And yet we're not doing anything. So we don't need new technology to change that for our own health, for the health of the planet and for the animals. And yet we're not doing it, right? And so that's why the core of my work for the last 10 years has been to say technology is not enough. That's my message, basically. 
technology is not enough. It is necessary. We cannot survive as a civilization without technology. But let's not think that technology is the silver bullet that can solve all of our problems. Many of our problems do not require any technology, require personal and collective sacrifice and commitment and paying a price uh, with changes in our behavior that would make life better for the future generations and for our ecosystem and for our climate. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, would you say that perhaps ethics and morality is a huge component of our being able to keep up with this progress that we've been experiencing, particularly throughout the, uh, the previous two uh, centuries or something like that since the Industrial Revolution, because it, was, uh, really, it had really a big impact in our way of living in, and in our economic and moral progress? Would you say that that is a big component and perhaps technology itself, it can go one way or the other. It also, it always depends on how people use it, right? Exactly right. And so the future doesn't depend on the technology per se. It depends on how we would use it. And that would be an ethical choice. That would be a moral choice. And that could leave us to destruction or self-destruction or to salvation. In fact, so wh whatever end we get to, whether we get to populating the cosmos or whether we get to self-destroying ourselves, it would not be technology's fault. It would be our fault or our credit if we don't get there and we populate the cosmos, of course. Um, but the, 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 we are still the agents. So we have the responsibility, uh, collectively at least, and Therefore, we, we have no excuse, we cannot blame the technology, but we have to be cognizant of that situation and we have to be very deliberate about which way we want to steer uh, technological process, how we use that technology. Because if you think about it, one potential explanation of the Fermi paradox, uh, which is to say why there's, we don't, there's so many stars with so many exoplanets uh, orbiting around them, which are in the Goldilocks area, just like our planet is. And yet, we, where are all the aliens? We, we, we can't seem to find any, any other intelligent life so far other than us. And one potential explanation could be that po probably civilizations uh, have exhibit this kind of pattern, which we are kind of reaching the climax of potentially right now, which is they're born, they live, they live, they reach a point where their technological power starts exceeding their um, ethical or moral wisdom, which is to say the ability to control and apply wisely that power, and therefore they simply self-destroy themselves, and then they go extinct, right? And so we might be able to play into that pattern just like possibly everyone else out there, or we might be able to break it, I hope. And so my whole work for the last 10 years has been hoping or pushing towards that end of focusing on the ethics. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there are even other aspects of ethics in how we might apply our technology. So, for example, you are a big advocate of things like transhumanism, and I guess that at least part of it would include enhance people and then our biological systems, let's say, as much as we can. But that also brings at least some, let's say, existential questions. Because, for example, when we're talking about life extension and perhaps enhancing some aspects and not others and things like that, I mean, this is also not something that is exclusively of the realm of science. Yeah, and, and you know, with respect to transhumanism, I am still a big fan of it, but I've, gone to, I've gotten to moderate my position a little bit to the degree that I see, unfortunately, a lot more people, and probably that's maybe even the, the paradigm, embrace technology as a silver bullet. And so, for example, I see a lot of transhumanists who have all these very unhealthy or bad habits, things like smoking, overeating, obesity, alcohol, poor diet, and so they take their transhumanism as a free check that gives them freedom to do whatever the heck they want, to drink, to eat, to party, to do drugs, to do all kinds of stupid stuff, and hope that 
they yes they would be able to to abuse their body uh, overuse and overconsume and and so on and yet technology is going to come and save them in the 11th hour and allow them to start afresh so this is like saying okay i would be um uh, a transhumanist alcoholic or uh, or a junkie drug user and uh, you know I would have cirrhosis and I would have very advanced stage of liver disease and I know it but because I'm transhumanist I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing and then eventually when my liver dies I'm simply going to bioprint or clone a new liver get a liver transplant and start the, the, the cycle again right Whereas I'm saying, okay, look, it's great to have that technology for liver transplants and to, you know, bioprint new organs and to give us another chance. But, hey, isn't it smarter to not waste that second chance and instead of just relying on the technology to actually consider, look at yourself in the mirror first, consider your own habits and consider if or when those personal habits of yours may actually be the cause so instead of trying to fix something from the outside, try and fix your own personal behavior and then use the technology, of course, right? And so that's that's a point where, unfortunately, I find many transhumanists fail, uh, fail to grasp or, or, or behave responsibly about. Mm -hmm. And at the economic level, would you say that it would be possible for us to somewhere in the future reach a point where, particularly due to the development of artificially intelligent systems, uh, we would be able to just have the machines working for, for us and extracting economic value from the natural resources they have around them uh, and us not really have not really having to do that much to keep the economy going. Uh, 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 this is absolutely a possibility. It's not a certainty, though, uh, and and so anything is possible. We we the future is not set in stone, uh, and what's going to happen will depend on how we apply our technology. So the thing about technology is, especially advanced technology like AI, is that we can either choose to replace ourselves or you can choose to empower ourselves. And that's a fundamental difference, but it's not a technological difference, it's an ethical difference, right? So if you're starting up with your point that, okay, I have a private company and my job is basically to replace all the doctors out there, to invent AI that will be able to diagnose people better than doctors, and then collect the money or a fraction of the money that used to be paid to doctors now to me and all those people are useless now. So if that's your starting point, uh, you can end up doing more damage than good, right? So it's, it's, it's an important thing to accomplish, but, but why not start thinking instead, okay, instead of replacing those people, how can I empower them? How can I allow a doctor to have a lot more time with their patient uh, for, for example, by not wasting too much time on the diagnosis, the machines can do that better than us, right? The AI can take care of that, or by filling paperwork, or by doing traveling from one patient to another because you can go and vi see them all virtually or what have you. But allow them to have that human-to-human -human contact um, uh, or allow them to, to add some other value in terms of the relationship or in terms of putting people at ease, making them comfortable and, and, and stuff like that. Things which are, by the way, very important, right? Uh, and so instead of replacing, we go for empowering. And so multiply that by all the vocations out there, right? From, you know, the production line worker to the taxi driver to the doctor to the lawyer to anyone else you can think of. We can get to a point where we don't have to work for a living or for money and where we have so much surplus uh, and especially when you combine that with uh, near infinite uh, solar power at near zero marginal cost, right? Then anything is possible, right? But if we get there or whether we would get there would depend on 
how we approach that and what's our ultimate goal because and if it's a long-term goal or a short-term goal because if our short-term goal is just to make money and put those people out of business and have the next generation of, of something then we can do more damage because if um, again if a massive percentage of the population loses their jobs uh, and by massive I mean anything equal or greater than 30 percent uh, there could be armed rebellions there could be and you see in Paris for God's sake of all the people that is already happening we've seen that in Spain we've seen that in many places now think about North America especially the United States people are so armed and, and militant uh, if you will in some cases for some reasons and and they're exhausted they're tired they're underslept they're overstressed they're overworked they they have not rested enough they don't get vacation often at all um they they haven't gotten enough consistent medical care and medical attention and so that's a very explosive social situation where you know they there can be so much damage done by these people who lost their jobs because they don't see a future for themselves and they're so much full of hell, uh, hate and disappointment and they don't see any hope for them in that system. So we have to make sure that the system protects all those people, the most vulnerable. And that's also due to self-interest because uh, we know that when we have social polarization between the richest and the poorest, that's where we have the powder keg of a revolution happening. So it's it's just, you know, wise politics or, or governance, even if you will, that we need to have, you know, safety nets for those situations and for those people. But if we fail to do that, then anything is possible. If we do that, then we can reach that situation that you describe where the machines do all the work, we get a, a guaranteed uh, income, and then we just freely create whatever we want to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are several points there that you mentioned that I want to tackle here, but let's start sure. by the, let's start by this. So at a certain point you refer to doctors. So I would like to ask you, uh, um, so probably or at least if we follow down that route, uh, technology would allow us to perhaps uh, rely the some boring and repetitive tasks to be done by artificial intelligence systems and perhaps even to, for uh, allow for people and professionals to focus more on more meaningful uh, ways to use their time perhaps to cooperate with other people or perhaps to have more time even to be with their patients and and not not having to do those boring tasks that uh, really consume a lot of time so that that's another way by which if we apply it correctly technology could even give more meaning to our lives right Absolutely. So only, only, the only tweak I want to make there is that it's not that technology would give meaning to our life. We are the ones to give, give meaning to our life. Technology is merely going to give us the opportunity for us to do so, right? Because if you don't have the technology to create surplus, whether it's food surplus, whether it's energy surplus, whether it's living quarter surplus, health surplus, all those surpluses, then you don't have that opportunity. I mean, you do, if you're the king, then you, you have those surpluses, but most of the population doesn't. So you need the technology for sure, but then what you use with that surplus is up to you, and how you give meaning to that is up to you. So you may not have to work a day of your life, but if you decide just to get high and to play video games all day long, on the one hand, there's nothing wrong with that and no one should like stop you or, or punish you or in any way for that. That's your free choice. In ch and this is where ethics uh, is very important or is my personal guide at least uh, because I would say, but yeah, but I would want to do something more with my life uh, uh, other than because the meaning of my life in my view would not be getting high uh, or wire heading and playing video games right and then i would be the one to give myself a meaning so it's like we are this these walking answers it's not like we are born and then we ask the the cosmos or the universe 
what is the purpose of meaning uh, of life or what's the meaning of life right and we're waiting for an answer to come back at us no it's actually this is upside down it's like the universe has created our planet which has created life which has created intelligence life which has created us and so we are here today and so it's like the universe is asking us what's the meaning of life and then it is for each of us individually to answer that question and to say well in my opinion this is the meaning of my life and once we get to that surplus once we get to that amazing uh situation of abundance then each of us will be able to provide their own answer and that would be absolutely phenomenal so for example you wouldn't have to go to work for a living and to make money but also a lot of people make decisions or on what to do with their life simply based on status on money so i know a lot of people who are very artistically inclined or otherwise and yet they decide to go become lawyers why because that's where they're going to make money right or have some kind of status or something like that right and then they get stuck in the life and a lifestyle that they never liked in the first place and they're miserable and unhappy all their life even though they have a three uh, garage house with three cars and their kids go to school and all of that they're not happy and they don't find fulfillment right so in the situation of radical abundance they will be able to say no i don't there's no point of me being a lawyer instead i'm going to do whatever you know i'll be a musician or a philosopher or an artist or a doctor or i'll go travel the world or whatever and and then with that kind of free choice you'll be able to provide an answer to the question that the universe is asking us all mm -hmm. okay so i would also like to ask you your opinion about big data systems and how they might be employed because i mean this is a thing that really worries a lot of people nowadays because particularly through things like social media there are big data systems operating there that perhaps at least in some ways exploit people or exploit their personal data but yeah. i mean but i mean perhaps if we take another route here another path it we would be able to use those same systems for a greater good that is for them to make decisions some very important decisions better than uh, humans themselves can do correct yes uh, so so first of all yes I'm very concerned about those systems uh, and secondly they could so technology is non-deterministic right uh, and, and the reason why I'm very concerned is because, as I said, I grew up in the Eastern Bloc. I grew up in the in Communist Bulgaria, where we had state security, and where we had, uh, uh, you know, uh, every citizen had like a secret file that the government was compiling on them, um, and there was like surveillance, and you can go and report on your name neighbor, and that information would be added to their secret file thing compared to what Google and Facebook and others have on us today especially Facebook right mm -hmm. and so technology is non-deterministic you see uh, we had you know steam engines and rails and guns uh, um, and trains and cars and and roads and ships and you can use you can use all of those to build uh, a democracy or you can use all of them to build like a communist uh, dictatorship of the proletariat supposedly or you can use them to build an authoritarian regime uh, with like a absolute dictator right so in all cases the technology is the same but how it's being used gets you to a different result and so I'm very concerned that Today, we live in a moment where we have, and in the future, even more so than today, but already, uh, we have the most powerful technology ideal for surveillance, for domination, for brainwashing, for anything of that sort that would benefit uh, dictatorships uh, or, or massive, massive manipulation at large scale, like the whole demographic or population manipulation, if you will. Uh, on the other hand, whether we would allow that to happen or not would greatly depend on ourselves still. 
So I am concerned, though, that right now the momentum that we have is not good. Uh, in other words, as Elon Musk said during the Beneficial AI conf uh, conference in uh, Asilomar, uh, and I'm paraphrasing badly, but he said everything that helps power aggregate is um, dangerous and anti-democratic. And everything that helps power uh, disseminate and decentralize is therefore pro-democratic and, and should be supported. That's very poor paraphrasing perhaps, but but the idea is that right now we have more power in the in the, the hands of fewer people than ever before in the history of our world. And unfortunately, the trend is that in 10 years, we'll have probably the first trillion years. And um, those trillion years would be richer than half of humanity, right? No, and not only in terms of monetary value, but also in terms of access, of them being able to access the personal information of billions of people and manipulate that, not only the information, excuse me, but also those people, what they see, what they perceive, how they behave, because we know that Facebook can do all kinds of tricks on your timeline and make you feel happy or depressed or upset or angry. And they've done, we know also they've done experiments exactly like that, right? Uh, and, and so they can manipulate us emotionally, they can manipulate us commercially to buy or not to buy a certain product, they can manipulate us politically, vote or don't vote, uh, go join the protest, uh, the yellow uh, vests or don't join them, right? That all depends on stuff that you see on your timeline or in other places, right? And now when you put those together with the fact that they're actually aggregated and they're owned by the same people, so Instagram is owned by Facebook and all on and YouTube is owned by Google. We have those huge monopolies, right? So I'm I'm really worried about that. Uh, very very worried. And I honestly, I quite honestly think that they should be broken up. That we benefit from having ten YouTubes instead of one YouTube. We benefit from having you know at least three or four or five Facebooks instead of one. We benefit from having you know ten search engines with. 10% market value than one search engine with 90 some percent market value actually. And that stuff really worries me and I think so far we haven't had the political will. Actually in Europe we, we you could say we could, we have had it because there have been some steep penalties. And the more we learn about Google's policies, policy, policies in Europe and across the world, for example, the scarier it gets, right? They have nothing left from the original principle of do no evil. Almost like right now is basically the winner takes it all and that's true for Facebook and it's true for Google and those are good people but the system is structured in a way that it's not up to the people anymore and once you have shareholders and you, you have to maximize value and all those things then you're basically hijacked by that kind of prime, uh, prime, prime directive if you will and everything else is secondary so I'm very concerned. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I mean, at least at certain levels and when we're talking about employing certain types of technology that then have some implications in terms of people perhaps losing some agency in terms of being able to make decisions and things like that. I think that uh, there are at least some obvious examples of positive outcomes of it like for example if we were to use uh, a completely integrated uh, system of self-driving cars when it is sufficiently developed of course then we would be able to virtually reduce the number of car crashes to zero so i think that that would be a good example of of what i'm saying Okay, but, but it's not just so simple, right? So, yes, you could probably get the number close to zero, but let me give you another example. So, right now we are conducting a huge experiment here in Toronto called the Smart City. Mm -hmm. And basically, Google is doing their first and biggest experiment in the world where they are going to, uh, or not Google, but one of their subsidiaries, because Google is not Google anymore, it's Alphabet, and now they cover everything from A to Z. 
So one of their subsidiaries is creating smart city zone in Toronto, which spends a number of blocks and it will be the first place in the world where everything is built to be a smart city from the internet up. So smart for smart cars, smart pedestrians, heated streets, uh, sensors everywhere, data being collected everywhere, everything monitored, everything coordinated. So yeah, in that area, you could say, well, look, uh, there's no car crashes, there's no car accidents, um, people don't let, wait for the bus more than a minute, uh, everything is perfect. And that may all be true, but is everything perfect? And the answer is maybe not, or not necessarily at least, right? Because the question is who owns that data and who gets access to it and who controls it? Mm -hmm. And whoever is that, right? Um, they can basically be like the absolute monarch of that population. They decide everything. And, and if they're evil enough or to, up to a certain point, they can even decide who would live or die. Um, but uh, they can basically direct the whole population or manipulate it to their own, to do their own bidding. And right now here, there's a lot of opposition of what's going on in Toronto, by the way. Part of the problem is that the deal has been largely uh, closed behind closed doors. In other words, it has not been open. It was very unclear for the longest time who actually owns the data, whether it's Google, whether it's the city of Toronto, whether it's the citizens, because it's their data. Um, Many uh, large profile uh, people who were big, uh, uh, you know, fighters for privacy rights, uh, like Anne Kavukian, the former privacy commissioner, resigned uh, due to the fact that many of the things that Google and their subcontractors were doing were utterly unethical and, and, and self-serving. And so at the end of the day, you can get to a point where you almost get like to a North Korean kind of a state situation where a single company or a single individual knows everything about everyone all the time in real time and can manipulate every facet of society, right? Including with the latest developments of neuroscience, what's happening inside of people's heads, right? So. You know, I was born uh, born in Bulgaria, and you know, I I was lucky that they didn't have the technology of us of knowing whether in your head you're thinking, "Oh, this is all bullshit," right? The stuff that we're talking to me about the communist, the great communist leaders, is all nonsense, and I know it, right? But in the future, they'll be able to do brain scans and know if you agree or you don't agree from a distance, and they would know. This one believes, okay, he's all right. This one doesn't believe he's a risk factor. Put him in that line and those people we direct in this area and we do these things to them or we allow them to only go these places and, you know, the traffic light would always be red for them or it would direct them in this area and this would be always random checked on the airport and they would always do this, that and the other. And you become the absolute king. And imagine North Korea with such powerful technology, right? You would never have the possibility of rebellion. At least in the past, when you had horrendous situations where you had huge discrepancy between the monarch and the population, like in France, you had the French Revolution off with their head, right? But in the future, you get to a point where, and when you add the fact that now the proletariat or the working class is, no, is now becoming useless, so before, to be a dictator, you needed two things. First, you needed an army, right? To suppress the population, right? And then you needed a working class to produce something so that you have a strong economy. And, ho and hopefully with the army and with the economy, you control the country, you control the population, right? That's power, economic and military. Now, you don't need workers anymore to produce anything you can have robots. So those guys go and you don't need soldiers anymore. You can also have robots even for that, right? And you know, we know in the past that the day that you didn't pay your soldiers was probably the last day of your reign because then the soldiers themselves will take you down. But in the future, 
Robots don't need payment and you can pre-program them to be loyal to you until death or until they've, they're being destroyed. And so you don't need uh, people for work, you don't need them to be soldiers. You can do that all with robots and combine that with the fact that those people would be trillionaires so they can afford to build those robots, right? Whether for work or for self-defense or what have you. And they would have access to this tremendous information where they would have the advance. It's like playing poker, but they would always know your cards. <laughs> so they would always know who is the likely dangerous agent who is thinking of rebellion or thinking of democracy or thinking of taking you down. And they can preempt you. And then you have no chance. And now combine that with the fact that those people might be immortal. Right? So they would never get old. They would never die. You can have a dynasty that spans a million years. And, you know, it doesn't take a million years with exponential technology. It would take a century. And, and they would become a totally different species. And then you end up with the, what was it in Time Machine? The warlocks and the... You know, you have one class of the great Orson G. Wells. You have one class preying on another class, or we can get to a point of total extermination because we would become useless, right? They don't need us to work. They don't need us to be soldiers. They don't need us for anything. They can get everything they want from their robots. So why, why would they not kill us then and just exterminate us completely? Because in the past, if you had a rebellion, let's say the Luddites rebelled, you can't kill them all because the next day you still need some workers, right? When people go on a strike, you can shoot the two, one or two guys to disperse the crowd, but you can't kill everybody. But if you have robots and you don't need those guys at all, you can actually kill everybody and so what? Right? So we live in a very tricky situation and, and there's a lot of potential for abuse and I'm very concerned about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I mean, uh, it's always the scary element in these thought experiments that then uh, make us think that could lead to catastrophic, uh, catastrophic outcomes. It is always the human element here, right? Right, and that's why I say the responsibility would be up to us. We cannot blame the machines. We cannot blame the technology. Whether we get to hell or heaven, it will be our fault or our credit, and it's up to us. And that's why we should start thinking about the full spectrum now, and we should start uh, steering towards the better outcomes rather than the, than the, than the worse ones. Uh, and, and, yeah, it's up to us. We are the ones who to blame. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, exactly. Okay, so Mr. Danilov, let, let's end on that note. And just before we go, would you like to tell people what are some of the best sources for them to get in touch with your work? Well, the easiest place perhaps to follow me is just uh, go to my homepage, which is uh, singularity.info, and uh, you would find everything there. If you are on iTunes or Stitcher uh, Radio or SoundCloud or anything like that, my podcast uh, is called Singularity.fm. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my blogging and podcasting name is Socrates. But, uh, yeah, if you find me there, then you'll find links to most things that I do in most places that I'm at. Okay, very well. So, Mr. Danilov, again, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show. And thank you a lot for taking the time. My pleasure entirely. Great job with the questions. I really enjoyed it. Thank you too. Hi guys, thank you so much for watching this video until the end. I would also like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and see if you can make a pledge there. I would really be thankful for that. And finally, I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanche, Per Helga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantal Gelinas and Jim Frank. Thank you a lot for all.